Hello, beautiful vegans. I'm Marikita Solis, the founder of Empower Vegan Empowerment Coaching. <laughs> I'm forgetting who I am. I'm not, we're having a little technical difficulties here. I've been moving for about a week, so my brain is a little bit fried. So just so you know, um, but I am here and I'm excited. I've missed y'all. So this is the Empowered Vegans live stream. And today I'm excited to talk to Serena Farb of the International Vegan Earth Day March. She founded this beautiful march that just started this year. And I'm excited to talk to her. And she was born vegan, even more exciting. So thanks for watching. Please let us know who's watching. I see Tiffany and Vegan Pundit are here. And let us know where you're joining from. If you have any questions for us, I am joining from my phone. Like I said, we had some technical difficulties, but that's okay. The show must go on. <laughs> so thanks for joining us. And thank you, Serena, for being here and, <clears throat> and for sharing your wisdom and everything you're doing. Um, so let's begin. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, happy to talk and answer any questions good do you hear that crackling or is that just off my line i do hear it um hmm okay it seemed like it just went away can yeah you when you muted yourself it went away <laughs> all right is okay so are we good now it's there when you talk, but. <laughs> all right, then let's let you do all the talking. Why don't you tell us about the, um, tell us about you, your journey and what it's like being born vegan. Okay. Um, yeah, so I had a very unique upbringing. Um, I was born and raised vegan in Kansas. So my story kind of starts with my mother who worked for um, a ph pharmaceutical company in the early 1990s in the Midwest region. And she'd always been a lifelong animal lover and, um, you know, things like that. But basically she ended up working in this job and part of her job had her consulting with and touring animal testing labs, chicken hatcheries, pig farms, um, and, and factory farm facilities, essentially. And what she saw firsthand with her own eyes made her want to go vegan and have her personal choices opt out of that, supporting that food system right there. But we also, um, I also come from a long Jewish background and that kind of gave her this strong sense of justice and always standing up for, you know, the most innocent beings. And so there were a lot of things she saw while working in these facilities that just really, you know, baffled her. Like she saw people good people doing horrible things who were then good, caring, kind people in other areas of their lives. And so she basically took that and said, I want to raise children who will never be able to do this, who will never be able to sort of turn a blind eye and participate in, in an injustice in one area, even though they're good, kind, caring people over here. So that's kind of the mentality she decided to raise children with. Um, now, when she went vegan, this was around 1992, she had never met another vegan in real life. The internet <laughs> wasn't a thing. Um, you know, she, she barely, she didn't really know anybody else doing this. She didn't know anyone else raising vegan children or anything like that. So she just kind of set out to do this on her own and learn everything she could and decided to, to do this. Um, and my dad, who she met around that time while she was working that job, was definitely not vegan. Um, he was a meat and potatoes, Kansas guy. Um, and because she'd never met another vegan in real life, like it didn't even occur to her that she could marry someone who was vegan. So she basically asked him to agree to keep the home vegan, set the example in front of us, and raise her kids vegan. And he agreed. But um, she quit that job uh, before I was born. And... By the time I was about six months old, my dad was also vegan after her coming home crying and telling him everything she'd seen while working that job. So then I, I grew up in a vegan home and um, 
both of my my parents are vegan. And then they started taking us to protests and vegan conferences, a lot of different things like that, because there wasn't a great vegan community in Kansas. So that's that was kind of the background. But then my parents also really, they didn't just raise me vegan. They didn't just, you know, sort of feed me a vegan diet. They really taught me why we were vegan and the ethics around it. And I think that's so important when you're raising vegan children. So I grew up, you know, we use simple like things like we love animals, we don't eat them or cow's milk is for baby cows. When I was really little, age appropriate explanations. We visited animal sanctuaries where I got to meet rescued farmed animals. Um, but, but I always knew the why. So from, from when I was really, really little, again, it wasn't just a diet for us. It was this ethical principle and principle of justice. And so when I was about seven years old, my parents decided I was old enough that I could have my own food choices outside of our home. It was clear that our home would always be vegan, but that sort of when I was at school or at friends' houses, they decided up until that point, they'd read labels for me. They had made educated choices about what I was eating. Now that I was seven and could read on my own, they basically said, we think it's time that you get to make your own food choices. So if a friend tries to offer you something, it'll be your choice, you know, whether you want to eat that or not. But before getting my own food choices, they gave me these stack of note cards, flashcards that had about 40 different ingredients on them. And this wasn't just an ethics thing. This was also a health thing because my parents tried to feed us pretty healthy as kids. So it had ingredients like casein, whey, gelatin, um, and then also like red dye 40 and other um, unhealthy food additives that up until that point we hadn't really eaten as well. So it was all these flashcards and one side had the name like gelatin and the other side of the flashcard had a description of what that ingredient was and how it was made and why we didn't eat it. So I had to learn and basically, um, oh, okay, you're back. <laughs> There's a very loud echo of some. Okay, now it's mostly gone, I think. Um, but yes, yeah, so we had these, these flashcards and I had to learn all of these ingredients and be able to read them and explain what they were and why we didn't eat them. And once I could do that, then my parents were like, okay, we've educated you. Now this decision is, is your own. And for me, the only thing that really changed at that point was I felt really empowered in my own choices. So when friends would ask me, you know, oh, why can't you eat that? When they'd offer me something, I would say, oh, I can, I choose not to, it's my choice. So of course I stayed vegan, um, but uh, of my own choice at that point and continued to make educated uh, food choices for myself. So that's the, I'll, I'll stop there for a minute and you can interject or ask more questions, but that's the, the short background. Well, thanks. I, um, I didn't get to hear all of it, but I'm going to have to watch my own replay here. <laughs> thanks for carrying on. Yeah. So that's very exciting. It's very blessed that you were able to be born to parents, well, to your mom and then, you know, then your father who was a meat and potato kind of guy. That, that's amazing. It's, it's really wonderful. And so what was it like for you in school as a child? So I did have some issues in school, largely of my own creating, <laughs> because um, after I, when I was seven and I, you know, learned all these ingredients and note cards and I really was educated for myself, um, I really became an activist at that point. So I had this memory, I was in competitive gymnastics as a kid, and we used to get these goodie bags that had candy and stuff at them before competitions. And I was going through them one day, passing out all the non-vegan candy to like my friends. And this one, this one girl on our team, you know, looked at something I handed her and goes, oh, why can't you eat this? And I was like, well, I can, I choose not to. And she was, okay, why do you choose not to eat it? And I was like, well, it has gelatin in it. Do you know what gelatin is? And then I proceeded to describe in very graphic detail all of the knowledge I had about what gelatin was and how it was made. And I remember her just looking at me kind of stunned and she was like, oh, whatever. And then just popped the candy in her mouth. And I was just like, 
I was so shocked. I was like, I just told you all of this. How could you still want to do this? Um, but I, I took that to the next level then in school. And I remember in sixth grade in particular, I was attending this Montessori school at the time where um, some of the kids brought their own lunch, but a lot also ate the school lunch, which was probably better than public school lunches, but still not, still not vegan or accommodating of vegans or anything like that. But I uh, would bring graphic flyers with me to school and literally open them up in people's faces while sitting at the lunch table, like someone would be eating meatloaf across from me. And I would open up this like flyer titled, like, even if you like meat that had like graphic images of animal slaughter, I'd literally open it up in their face and be like, that's what you're eating. Isn't that gross? Like, why do you want to eat that? So I joke that like half of my sixth grade class hated me and half went vegetarian. So, you know, <laughs> you win some, you lose some. <laughs> That's too funny, but that's that's very interesting because, well, I also work with We Did Adult Health, and we're having a month coming up when we're talking about children and babies and, and you know, these issues. So it's, it's very important how, how do children navigate these issues when they're the only vegan and and they haven't, especially you, who didn't has never known anything else but that. So, yeah, yeah. it's exciting. And so... Well, so when you went to, um, when did you start doing activism? Well, that was activism. <laughs> yeah, like I, I mean, I, I grew up doing it. Like I attended a circus protest when I was 10 or 11. Um, I was leafleting on college campuses with my parents when I was like seven years old. Um, my mom would take me and my sister out and uh, I helped tabling, food sampling. Like I, I grew up pretty much doing activism, so. Wow. What, and did your dad do, does he do activism too? No, he's not really an activist. He He's begrudgingly helped serve food and helped us table, but uh, it's not really his passion. <laughs> <laughs> what about your cousins or the other parts of your family? Oh, no. <laughs> um, no, even though my immediate family is vegan and I'm very grateful for that, we still have all the same issues that a lot of other people do. Um, my mom's parents, my grandparents on that side, were pretty supportive and that's a whole other story I could get into. Um, my dad, my mom's dad, my grandfather had actually been plant-based back in the eighties after he like had a heart attack or angina, I had some health issues, um, but he never, and he wasn't vegan or plant-based when I was growing up, that was before me. He had already slipped off that wagon and, and decided he enjoyed meat again. Um, but they were they were fairly supportive. But like my aunts, my mom's sisters uh, have always strongly disagreed. Um, cousins have never really understood. So there was a lot of like, you know, OK, we'll come join you at this event after dinner's over. You do your barbecuing or whatever. We'll join after dinner for, you know, fruit and and dessert, maybe. Um, but we did a lot of trying to avoid uh, celebrations around you know, animals and um, so, yeah, there's definitely been some conflict in our extended family around that. Yeah, and I'm sure that we all can relate here. We're all struggling with, well, a lot of us are struggling with feeling like outsiders. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and so in your experience, have you seen a lot of change? Absolutely. I mean, you know, when I graduated high school over 10 years ago, I like the idea of meeting someone who's even vegetarian in my high school. And, and just for reference, like I went to a high school um, in a fairly progressive college town. It's in Kansas, but University of Kansas is here, Lawrence, Kansas. Um, so like the high school was, you know, in a relatively progressive area. But the idea of even meeting someone who was vegetarian was exciting to me. I knew maybe there were one or two other vegetarians. Um, that was really it. I didn't know any other vegans. And if I'd met someone else who was vegan in high school, I would have like freaked out and been so excited and assumed we were going to be instant best friends. Um, and then like four years later, my sister graduated and she already knew like a handful of like five or six other vegans at the time. And then like since then, I've talked to some other people who are students there now. And they're like, oh, yeah, like tons of vegans. They're like, it's just like it's just become so much more normal. It's not like 
this, oh, we must start a club and all be friends and um, cause it's now so much more acceptable and normal to just be vegan or at least eat plant-based. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's really incredible. And then another thing where this was in uh, 2018 or 19, I think that I realized how much things had changed. I was on a plane leaving Kansas city and the people I sat down next to, I overheard them talking about like a beyond burger. And I was still in the headspace at that time, like 20, 2018 ish. If I heard someone talking about a, a plant-based brand, my assumption was they must be vegan because you know, that's how it is. They're the only people that would talk about something like that. So I'm like, Oh, are you guys vegan? And they're like, no, we just run a restaurant in Kansas city. And, um, you know, we know everybody's got to have a vegan menu these days. So we're just, you know, talking about our vegan menu. And that just kind of blew my mind of like, wow, there's non vegans that are realizing that they have to just have a vegan menu, even here in Kansas City at their restaurant. And I like 10, 15 years ago, that would have absolutely shocked me. I would never have heard that. And I forget like how much that's changed because now that's just normal. Like now that conversation on the airplane wouldn't surprise me at all. But 10 years ago, that would have been like mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, especially I would think in Kansas City too. <laughs> yeah. Aggressive over there. But that's where Victoria Moran's from, right? Kansas yes, City. yes. She was the only other person that my mother uh, met raising vegan children when we were really little. The only, I think she might have met her around the time I was born or she had me somewhere around there. Um, and that was the first other person like, oh, someone else has raised a vegan child. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, th this is very inspiring. And I see um, this is um, Cassandra Claudia. <laughs> this is this is beautiful to be born vegan. This is a true blessing. Yes. Amen to that. And um, and BJ is Rebecca from um, Climate Healers saying love the flashcards idea. Yes. And I'm thankful that everybody's watching. We got um, JJ from Vegan Knowledge saying hello here. And Tiffany says she sort 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 of knows you. <laughs> so yeah, I think that you've got a lot of fans, um, Serena. So cool. Tell us about um, so what so what did you do in college? What kind of activism did you do then? Yeah, so I founded and ran like a vegan and animal rights group on my college campus. And that was really when I got into activism for myself. I mean, I'd done it growing up a lot, but I also up until that point thought I was going to go get a degree and get my PhD in biochemistry and do like scientific research. And it was in college where that really started to shift. Um, and I was doing a lot of activism and realized like that was really my passion and what I wanted to spend my time on. And um, so I did everything. We did a bunch of movie screenings. We held um, like I did a vegan dinner that we like had free tickets to and people could come and we had a speaker and a movie. We got the dining hall to do like um, make the whole main bar vegan for like the, the either like World Vegan Day or the Great American Meat Out, like some one of those events. Um, so we worked with the dining hall. And then I brought um, Richard Openlander at the time to speak about uh, sustainability. He came to campus and I set up some meetings with him, with the dining hall staff as well to talk about um, their sustainability program and food. We had another speaker come to campus. Um, I did a bunch of tabling and like leafleting and pay-per-views outside the dining hall. That was that was a really powerful event. We had over, I think, two, between two and three hundred students um, that all we paid a dollar to like watch four minutes of uh, slaughterhouse footage, and a bunch of people from that like pledged to go vegan or try um, and eat more vegan meals. Um, what else did we do? We did, yeah, lots of. Lots of movie screenings, speakers, educational events. I brought another speaker in. Uh, my second year and got her to give some lectures, public lecture, and then also into some social justice classes. And she spoke to those classes as well. Um, so yeah, just a whole bunch of <laughs> different stuff on campus. 
um, that really just kind of sparked my passion for wanting to do that more full time ish. Yeah, that, that's amazing that you have all these different experiences. And so what do you think is works the best for conversion? Yeah, um, it's a really good question. And I honestly think different things work best for different people. Different things will reach different people. And we also have to figure out like what our strengths are. Like that can't be ignored when talking about what's effective. So like for me, I know what I think I'm best at and what's most effective, but that's based on like my skills. Like I really like talking to people. I really like doing um, like the pay-per-view or cube of truth model where you're showing people footage and then having one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. Um, I think that's really powerful. I think, you know, I, I do a lot of speaking in university classrooms and, and high school classrooms now. I find that really powerful and effective. Um, and, and when I was, I used to teach high school too. And when I taught high school, I also taught like a vegan, three-day vegan class at the high school. And that was really interesting for me to see the difference between you know, when you get to have multiple days of repeat exposure with students versus just a few minutes or an hour even, um, the power of that kind of more immersive being able to spend several days covering all the various topics related to this. Um, I, I think we need all kinds of different activism. I think all, all different kinds together will change things. I'm a big fan of education and the Socratic method personally, though. Like, I, I like to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. I like to give lectures. And I've found that my goal isn't to get people necessarily to like say they're going vegan on the spot. I actually don't think that's the most effective because for me, I want people to change how they think. I want them to be critical thinkers and stop viewing animals as food. And sometimes people will say, I'm going vegan just to end the conversation or, you know, so I care less about someone saying they're going vegan on the spot if I can plant a seed and get them th thinking critically in a way that will lead to more long-term change down the road. And so for that, I, I've found I like to ask questions and I could spend an entire conversation like almost never saying anything or like challenging, even try trying to debate someone. I would rather just question like everything they say and try to get them being unsure of their own beliefs or like questioning their own ideas because I think if someone thinks something is their own idea they're more likely to change like people can be kind of defensive if they think like even if you're right but you're telling them oh this is how you're supposed to think I've seen people that are more resistant to it versus if I just question them and get them to kind of form that same thought, which obviously I've kind of put in their head, but indirectly, I think they're less resistant to it and more likely to be like, oh yeah, like this was my idea, so I'm gonna do this. So that's kind of my current uh, favorite approach. Well, that makes a lot of sense, definitely. Uh, allowing people to, to really, I mean, do the critical thinking like you're saying and not pushing for any fast outcome, right? But to have them go home and think about things, really change their opinion of animals. So definitely makes a lot of sense. That's a really good advice. And what do you do about bullies? I mean, do you, mm. do you ever engage online? Because I know a lot of people get frustrated online. They'll, <laughs> somebody will take a jab at them. Like I'm going to eat more meat or I love hot dogs, right? Yeah. What do you do about that? uh honestly almost nothing most of the time i find some of the things people say ridiculous and funny and um i try to only really engage with like authentic questions and sometimes i'll take people at face value and i'll be like i'm gonna treat this like it's an authentic question even though i think maybe it's not and then I'll see how they respond from there. And if then they respond and I'm like, clearly that was not an authentic question, then I'll just ignore it or move on. Um, and that's something I've kind of been dealing with my whole life. People have been poking fun at me, making fun at me. Um, and I've, I've just gotten really good at laughing it off, uh, ignoring it. Um, you know, I just, I don't take it too seriously. Um, I don't, there's a, a YouTube channel <laughs> 
that's all about like analyzing vegans and claiming that they're deteriorating over time. Um, and at one point they made a video like featuring me and it sent tons of trolls to my YouTube channel, all like analyzing my appearance, saying like, you know, oh, you're malnourished. You look like you're 50 or 60 years old. Um, you know, <laughs> like, you know, just, uh, you know, you blink too much. You have a, a neurological brain problem. Like you're being brainwashed, just like all the most wild stuff. And I just found it really funny. I was like, this is hysterical. Look how worked up these people are at like the fact that I'm living a good life without animals. Um, and, and even on the street, when I'm talking to people, you know, I think we can have different goals, right? So there's a lot of people that create content like debating people on the street. I think that's fantastic content. And online, I think that can be really good for people. But I think we do need to be aware of like, what is our goal in the moment? Is your goal to create good viral content? Or is it to actually reach the person and have a good conversation with the person there in front of you? And so I'm often more, especially because I like, don't film most of my conversations, like I'm more in the like, I'm trying to reach that person right there in front of me. And I think the approach to those things is very different. And so I try to avoid, depending on the context, um, like just debating people. And when I do cubes of truth and things like that, when trolls come by, like I don't chase people down to talk to them. I don't try and engage with people that are mad or angry at us. I want to spend my time engaging the people that I think are pre-vegans or are most open-minded. If I had all the time in the world, I'd have no problem. It can be fun to debate people sometimes. But when I'm in a situation of like, oh, do I talk to that person or that person? I ignore the people that are acting like bullies or trolls. And I try to talk to the people that I think are open-minded. And so I, I take that approach a little bit online as well. But I get so many comments on everything I put out um that are weird troll i love bacon i'm gonna eat more meat i just ignore most of them i don't have time to like respond and debate people and <laughs> no i know no i ah that's so funny now i had someone say oh well i, I love hot dogs they said i know this was to my friend's post and i said well i used to love them too you can have them all <laughs> you know they're all yours man uh-huh you know, I mean, but it's just silly. Those are just silly comments. I mean, I, I mean, well, I choose not to allow that to rattle me because I've got better things to do than be upset over who knows who that person is. Obviously, they don't have anything better to do than try to rattle me and whatever. I, uh -huh. I, yeah, and I gotta, I gotta spend my energy wisely. Yeah. So, yeah. So, tell us about. How did the the march start? The Vegan Earth Day March. Yeah, yeah. So I I co-organized that with Chelsea Davis, who's based out of Portland. Um, but the idea kind of originally came to me back in 2019. I was teaching high school at the time, and there were all of the youth climate strikes uh, going on, and Greta Thun uh, Thunberg. Um, I, think that, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but. Um, you know, she was getting, getting a lot of momentum with her school strikes, Fridays for Future stuff. And so I participated in some of those in Kansas City at the time and helped a bunch of my high school students participate in them. But then, and similar to when I was doing some environmental activism in college, I was always very frustrated by the lack of any conversation about animal agriculture and our food system in, you know, these environmental venues. And so I've had several experiences. I remember one in particular with the local Kansas City group. Um, someone organizing it was holding a like fundraiser and it was at an ice cream shop. And someone commented, maybe I did something asking about vegans or something, you know, like, oh, why are you doing dairy ice cream? They're like, oh, don't worry, there's a vegan option for the vegans. And my point was like, I don't care about the vegan option. My point is you're encouraging people to go out and purchase products from the very industry that you're protesting and destroying the planet. Like you're protesting climate change and then trying to get people to go buy dairy to support your protest for climate change. Um, and I've seen things like that a number of times and found it very frustrating. And so I kind of thought like, 
we have animal rights marches, but like we need an environmental and climate march that centers animal agriculture and addressing the role that our food systems play in our climate and ecological problems. So that idea kind of percolated for a while. In 2020, I hosted an online summit called the Climate Diet Summit that was kind of around that same idea. And then I was like, you know, maybe post pandemic, we'll do an in-person thing again. And then I got connected with Chelsea Davis. Um, Sorry. <laughs> and, and she's got, um, you know, a great background in event planning and organizing and has a lot of similar, um, you know, interests. And so we worked together and, uh, created what became the vegan earth day march and um it was really it was a really uh bit the biggest project i've ever <laughs> been involved in organizing i'll say that well that's that's very exciting i wanted to do that march i had another commitment uh, another well i was giving a speech for earth day mm. but one one year i'm gonna do it that's for sure um yeah and so what about the environmentalists why is there such a disconnection and how have you have you opened a lot of environmentalist eyes uh i wish i could say that um unfortunately in my experience i have found that many um environmentalists and just sort of um other social justice activists in general are some of the hardest that i've experienced trying to talk to about veganism they are some of the most resistant and I think it's because they already view themselves as so progressive and, and being concerned that they recognize, I think on some level, some of the hypocrisy around eating animals and the injustice of it and the environmental impact of it, but they don't want to admit that or like in, admit that they're kind of living out of alignment with their values. And so rather than changing, they come up with like, these really sophisticated intellectual sounding arguments. Whereas what I find is when I talk to just like the average person that's not an activist for these other causes, and you're like, why do you, you know, not want to go vegan? Or why do you still eat animals? They're like, I like the taste of meat, or it's can be like, they're very honest with you. Whereas I think that a lot of the things I hear from like environmentalists and social justice activists are kind of disingenuous, because it's like, they're actually still eating meat for the exact same reason as the average person, which is they like the taste of it or it's their tradition and it's convenient, but they recognize on some level that that doesn't fit with their values of like, I'm a social justice activist, I'm an environmentalist. And so they can't just say that. So then they're like, well, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. So, you know, us be, you know, personally, our choices don't really matter. We need to target the systems and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, which I'm, I think system change is extremely important too, a hundred percent. And this is kind of what we did with the vegan earth day March. We said like, we need both. We absolutely need system change, but we also can't ignore the role that individuals play because, and, and this is kind of my philosophy at the end of the day, how do we expect systems to change? How do we expect to hold CEOs accountable or have them sacrifice some of their profits or politicians, you know, not get voted into back into office, sacrifice something if we ourselves can't even change our personal dietary habits. So it's like people, it's really convenient. It's a really convenient argument to say we need system change, not individual change, because it allows you just to point the finger at everyone else and ignore, you know, any changing of your own actions or how that impacts things. Um, and so I see a lot of that in the environmental movement. Um, and, and, you know, and these industries are incredibly powerful and they have done a really good job. The meat and dairy industry, the fossil fuel industry, big ag, like all of them have done a really good job sort of brainwashing us as a, as a society um, that we need these products to survive and thrive and that this is the only way we're going to enjoy life. This is the only way they're going to taste good. This is sustainable. Um, and, and they're doing it all for profit and people fall prey to that. And it can be a really hard trap to get out of and be willing to actually, you know, change what's going on in your personal life. And then as well as protest and change the system. Yes, and I, I see it too because I see. Well, when I'm talking with the environmentalists 
and it just it's very astounding to me that I mean they'll say a lot of them will say they're flexitarian but they don't really want to go there you know they, it doesn't <laughs> I don't know I, I still well, oh, I'm just learning every day how how to how to reach people in a different manner right mm -hmm. yeah, you're right exactly not pawn it off on well the systems we all make we create the systems I mean our absolutely choices, our food choices like the power of the fork like you're saying um, yeah that's what creates it and we've got a lot of porn but now when you go to the store I mean my gosh there's a lot of vegan choices I mean just in the past 10 years it's amazing or five years the milks and um, and and the cheeses it's really a, unbelievable it's, it's a blessing so if we just keep if we all just keep moving forward right I mean and, and then people will say all the time oh I'll never be vegan do you have any stories of someone saying I'll never be vegan and that you know like some and that someone well you know like the ranchers mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll never be vegan and then they are vegan but do you have any good stories like that you could share with us I don't I mean I I know a lot but like like I've heard that from a number of people they're not not anyone that like I've convinced to go vegan but uh, friends and people I know who have said, you know, I was absolutely that person saying I could never go vegan. And then one day it changed. Um, but I don't remember enough of the details of anyone's uh, individual story. Um, but well, one, one thing I can share is when I was teaching high school and I created this vegan class, I wanted to sort of quantify as best I could the impact the class had. So I had all of the high school students in my class fill out um, a survey beforehand and do things like rate on a scale of one to 10, how likely you would be to go vegan. And then we did the same thing at the end of the class again as well. And I did have uh, a handful of students, two or three, that at the beginning of the three days wrote like one, I'll never go vegan on a scale of one to 10. And then at the end, put like 10, like I'm probably gonna go vegan now or try to go vegan. Wow, well, that's very inspiring. That's a good story. <laughs> it's very hopeful because I know I was one of the people that would think, no way, I'm never gonna go vegan, right? And I know that a lot of us will get despair when we hear that, but it's not, not, ne it's not necessarily true. I mean, people change things change and people awaken they're on that journey every day stepping forward and learning and no one stays the same thank goodness i hope nobody stays the same it'd be a very boring life if they did so yeah yes and um here's a here's a comment the disconnect is about also about profit for the rich and powerful yeah that's very true Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you're talking about. I'm looking at, I'm looking at YouTube over here because, <laughs> because, well, because I was racing around trying to get online and I didn't get all my little notes ready. I want to make sure that we cover everything. Um, yes. And the importance of connecting climate and sustainability with diet and veganism in a holistic way. Yes. Um, and would you say that veganism is a spiritual journey for you um probably in in many ways um one of the things that i i have said to people is you know it's very telling to me that the diet and lifestyle that doesn't harm animals unnecessarily and that is best for the planet also happens to be the healthiest and best for us and that's, that's kind of uh, my spiritual perspective to it, which is like, isn't that interesting that there's one diet and lifestyle that would allow us to live in harmony with the earth and our fellow earthlings and beings that we share the planet with and that keeps us healthy and thriving. Um, and that's eating plants. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I feel like that's very, it is spirituality. I mean, it's in tune with the harmony of nature and and sustainability helping mother earth how how we're turning our back on her is is incredible so um, we're we're just keep doing what we're doing so let's see we got another comment here 
Renee King Son and a Roddy Girl Sanctuary got her cattle ranch or husband to go vegan and turn their ranch into a sanctuary for their cows and now helping other ranchers do the same. Yes, that is yep. that is just really amazing. So people can change. Don't Absolutely. believe it when people say that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And and look, you're a born vegan, so you're <laughs> you're a perfect example. So what would you say to the mothers that are struggling with not knowing how to deal have, with having a child, how, making things better for their vegan children? What would you say to them? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I'd say is, like, it's really, really important to remember just how powerful the forces in society are, how steeped into every fiber of our culture eating animals is. And I say this because... You know, even my mom has told me, like, she had a lot of fears, you know, raising a child vegan, even though she had done her research and read the nutrition literature and believed it would be healthy and probably healthier. She was still afraid that she might be doing something wrong. And so, you know, uh, she's told this story of, like, I was about two years old and she and my dad were, like, swinging me by my arms and carrying me up the stairs that way. And I just like started crying out in pain. She thought I like had broken my arm or something, went to the doctor um, and the doctor was like, oh, that's called nursemaid's elbow. It's really common. It's like the joint just popped out and you're really not supposed to swing young children like by their arms. And so he just like popped it back into place, no big issue. But my mom says the first thing that went through her head, you know, when she was swinging me and I started crying out in pain was, oh, she must have weak bones because we're not giving her dairy. Something that she knew not to be true based on the scientific literature that she didn't believe, but that shows you how powerful the conditioning is, how powerful the forces in society are, that that was the thought that went through her head. And she's had that a number of other times, like, oh, we got a cold, oh, we had normal things that like, you know, happen regardless of what diet you're eating. And she'd always be like, oh, would they be healthier if they were eating, you know, meat or dairy? Um, and and she stayed strong in it and has, you know, always continued to raise us vegan. But I've seen lots of parents that start out with good intentions, want to raise their children vegan, and then essentially fall prey to those fears and shift what they're doing. Because, you know, the power of like wanting to make sure you're doing what's right for your children is really, really powerful. But so are those forces in society that are trying to convince everyone we need to eat animal products. And so when that is the people around you, your friends, your family members, your extended family, the culture, the TV, the doctors, um, if we aren't always aware of that, I think it's really, really easy for that to sort of seep into just, you know, the way parents are thinking and not realize like, oh, I'm starting to think this way because of propaganda. Oh, I'm starting to think this way because of all this wrong information in society. Instead, they kind of just fall prey to it. So I think my number one tip is like, be aware of how powerful those forces in society are. And for as much as things are changing and becoming more normal, it's still heavily steeped that way. Um, you know, when I was about eight years old or something, um, in my, I went to a new doctor for the first time in a while for a physical exam or something. And this doctor absolutely freaked out when he learned that my sister and I had never eaten dairy. Just, you know, <laughs> like, you must have weak bones and no calcium and no protein. And like, how can you be doing competitive gymnastics? This is dangerous. He ran all these tests on us because he was convinced. He was like, I need to run all these blood tests. And was literally shocked when they came back and showed that we were thriving. He was just like, you've never had cow's milk, you know? So like that just shows you when supposedly the most educated people in society, the experts that parents and people look to for, you know, as authority figures, they not only many of them don't know what's true, they are steeped in propaganda and this, you know, wrong information on, the, on this topic as well. But that's really powerful. And if we don't think critically about that, doctors can be very influential to parents and, and, you know, parents can stop doing their own critical thinking. So just you have to be constantly aware of the water we're essentially swimming in, the air we breathe and how filled with wrong information, propaganda from the meat and dairy industry it is. Um, 
and to be aware that you have to educate your children too. Like you, I think you can't just raise your kids vegan and not talk about it because likewise, the things that they're going to be exposed to on TV, in books, in like, it's going to be counter to the information, you know, you're presenting. So you have to educate your children as well. But then with that, find community. I think that is so, so important. And so like for my family, we didn't have a, a great vegan community in Kansas or anything like that. But we did go every single year to attend Vegan Summerfest in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Um, and it's happening again. It happens at the beginning of July every year. So it's coming up. This will be the first one since COVID. Um, and, and before COVID, I had been pretty much every year of my life, um, you know, and my parents as well, like almost like 25 plus years that we've attended this conference. And it's a very family friendly conference and they have a kids center. And so I grew up as a child attending this conference, hanging out at the children's center. And that was the first place that one, I knew I could sort of eat anything without asking. So everywhere else in the world, I was so used to like, oh, can I see the label? Oh, what's in that? Is that vegan? And it was always exciting for me for this one week out of the year to come to somewhere where I was like, I know everything here is vegan. I can eat all the snacks they provide. You know, I can eat whatever in the dining hall without asking. So like that was very exciting to me where I had like this one week where I kind of got to be, you know, normal. And then I also met other vegan children, both younger than me, older than me. Many of them became mentors and friends that I still, you know, are some of my closest friends to this day. But that during the rest of the year when I was having, um, you know, difficulty or something was going on at school, these were people that I could call or write letters to, you know, was pen pals with some of them. And, um, um, and uh, could get that emotional support and sort of like know that um, someone, you know, shared my values and supported what I was doing. So, and there's so many more communities today, like there are more local vegan groups and parenting support groups, but I highly encourage parents to find community, find support, find some other vegans for their children to be connected to, even if that's online or from a conference on the other side of the country, um, community is so important. Yeah, and what if you want to start up a, a group? What's the best way to do that for children and parents? Just, I yeah, I said just start it. Like, you know, Facebook is a good place for that. There's a lot of vegan groups on Facebook. I've seen plenty of people say like, hey, I am a vegan parent. I've got a couple kids this age. Would anybody be interested in a you know, vegan kids get together? Um, you know, it's as simple as that start a group, start an email list, put the word out to your social network. And um, I think you'd be surprised at, at how many people you might meet and find through that. I think that's true because a lot of people feel alone and they say, well, there's no groups, but then that's the sign that they're the ones to start the group, like take the action like you're, you're doing. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, definitely. Here's another great comment. I watched this documentary yesterday about another rancher that went vegan. It's an amazing story. 73 cows with the BAFPA ending story of Jay and Katja Wild. Beef farmers who battle with their conscience every day, they take their cows to slaughter. Feeling trapped within an industry he no longer believes in, Jay knows he must make a change and do what no other farmer from the UK has ever done before. Well, I haven't heard of them. Have you, Serena? I, I've heard of them. I don't know a whole lot about them, but I, I have heard of that film. I have to check that out. Definitely. Thanks for sharing that. And we got a really good, another great comment. Great job for the whole life. <laughs> Needs much of courage. We need young, positive people like you. Yes. And I love the way that you just let the jokes and all the poking at you and bullying roll off, that you're so strong in yourself. So, I mean, you're strong in your beliefs. You know what you believe in, and you've been, and you've been doing this since a little girl, which is amazing. You know, it really is. Uh, so, I was going to see if there are any other any questions. Um, is that vegan pundit, did I show this comment? Fantastic advice for animal advocates. Yeah, this is really great advice. Um, Here's another one. 
a disconnect with non-vegans is either addiction or deep conditioning. Yes, I know. If foods are very addictive, the meat, they know what they're doing when it comes to the, these meat, all these concoctions, all these dairy concoctions and everything. So yes, they're very addictive. And then also the deep conditioning is what we talked about before. And even your mom questioning, like uh, when you, like with the, with the doctor saying, maybe I haven't, <laughs> haven't done the best for her. So, I mean, it's only natural that we have those ideas. So what about plant-based doctors? Do you have a plant-based doctor now? I don't really see doctors now. Um, I, uh, yeah, there, I, I think there's great sites, uh, like maybe plant-based doctor. I don't remember what it's called, but yeah, there's some where you can find plant-based doctors in Kansas city. We do have like, um, uh, a plant-based, uh, health practitioner that, um, I'd go to if I needed, but I pretty much, <laughs> I just avoid doctors right now. And I travel so much that, um, I'm not usually in one place for a super long time either. So, um, but I do recommend either through a plant-based health practitioner or on your own, like getting the occasional blood work done. And that's, that's what I've done on my own is just, you know, ordered blood tests, um, that I can get done. And, uh, just to, you know, check my vitamin D level and calcium and things like that, um, on occasion. Yeah, that's good advice. Definitely. So we have a question here from, Vegan Pundit. What definition of veganism do you use when doing advocacy? Um, I mean, the definition that I personally like and, uh, you know, adhere to is the vegan society's definition that veganism is a philosophy and way of living that seeks to exclude as far as possible and practicable, which is not the word practical, which a lot of people think it is as far as is practicable, all forms of cruelty and exploitation to animals for food, clothing, and any other purpose. And by extension, um, or then the second half of it is like, uh, you know, in dietary terms that denotes, uh, a plant-based diet, basically. Um, I don't have it all memorized, but that is, that is the vegan society's definition. But even more than that, one of the things I like, I've read a lot of the early documents from the night from like 1944, 1950s from Donald Watson and Leslie Cross, who were both Donald Watson, um, and his wife, Dorothy coined the term vegan and founded the first vegan society in the UK. And then Leslie Cross was one of the later VPs of the Vegan Society, but they both wrote these beautiful, incredible visionary articles um, before, and the Vegan Society's definition has been updated a few times, but when you look at these early documents, to me, they really show you what the core of veganism was, where they say things like veganism is about love and liberation and freedom for all beings from harm and exploitation. And that includes humans, like it frees um, our souls and our lives when we aren't you know, addicted to the flesh of other beings. Um, it's a, a Leslie Crossing wrote about how it's a principle of non-exploitation. It's a principle of non-violence. Um, so I, I look to all of those. Um, that said, in my day-to-day -day advocacy, I'm not going around and like defining the term vegan for everyone. And I'm also not usually correcting people's use of the term vegan these days. There have been times in my life where I was very passionate about the definition. Um, and that's just not where I'm at now. So that's what I know it means in my head. But if people refer to it, um, and I do try and distinguish like, I'll say a vegan diet to mean the dietary portion of veganism or a plant-based diet to distinguish, but veganism is uh, an ethical principle and social justice movement. So I, I use it in that way um, when I'm talking to people about living vegan, but I'm not like going around defining it. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. And I, and I feel that way too, in that kind of just being relaxed about it I mean and it but I mean it's as long as it's centered around love and love for and treatment 
and the the care of all living beings is the way I feel, right? But I don't want to get too technical and, and nitpicky. I hate the, the, the fights between vegans. No, that's a big issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing I think that we can all work on to really get along better because we're all working for the same goal. Whether, yeah, and whether maybe, maybe we don't agree with what they're doing, but as long as it's not hurting anyone, then allow them to do it, you know? So and yeah, and also having compassion for other people, realizing like they don't have to say, I'm gonna be vegan now. They just, just letting, if they're listening to, like you're saying, if they listen to you and they're having a good thought process, be thankful for that. Because that is really powerful. These little steps are, aren't so little. <laughs> I mean, and we have to take baby steps to, to make change. Change usually doesn't just happen like that. So definitely. Mm -hmm. And what about your sister? Is she big in the um, vegan field? She's vegan, but she's not really an activist. She's uh, doing other stuff with her life these days. Okay. Well, that's all good. She's vegan. That's a, that's a lot. So <laughs> I'm not here to judge. If you're a vegan, that's, that's good. I'm <laughs> rooting for you. <laughs> so and we got, let's see, we got another comment. Caring about all living beings should be a normal feeling for a human being. Strange that most of them don't feel like this. Yeah, so well, that's the conditioning again that we that we're brought up to the where some beings are more important than others, and definitely. So well, we're coming to the end of the show, and I'd really love for everyone to know how they can get a hold of you and if they want to make sure that the vegan march the earth day march is in their town what can they do yeah so um, my personal website is bornvegan.org and uh, that has all the links to my instagram and youtube and social media as well um and you can email me through there and then the vegan earth day march is veganearthdaymarch.org and you can sign up for updates on our website there. And when we are getting ready for the next March, we'll put a call out to uh, organizers to be city organizers. And so you just wanna make sure you're on our email list uh, right now for that. I wanna be an organizer. That would be so exciting. <laughs> so where, where were you? The, were you in Kansas City March or? No, I went to the New York City March um, and I spoke at that one. I didn't, I was organi helping organize all of them. I wasn't directly the New York City March organizer, um, but I went to that one because it was one of the bigger ones. Yeah, and well, that makes sense. So yeah, but we need marches everywhere. So if you're listening, please make sure you go to this website and sign up because it's time to take action. Even if it's just one action a year, we need you. So, yeah, and this has been very inspiring. So thank you so much, Serena. And thanks, everyone. Um, here's a, a sweet comment. Thank you so much for this precious live stream. Love you both. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, um, Cassandra. We, we know she's doing a lot and really working hard to, to educate people on the love of veganism and for all living beings. So, and all of you all are. And, so really, I really appreciate what everyone's doing, and especially Serena for coming to talk to us. Even despite all the technical difficulties, we still made the show go on and got a lot of great information and wisdom from you. Thank you. Really appreciate having you having me. <laughs> we'll have to do it again. So thanks, everybody. And I'll do the namaste vegan, everybody. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. <laughs>